Hey, good morning, Mike and Michael and Mr. Andy. How is everybody doing this morning? Good morning, Frank. How are we doing today? <clears throat> Let's see how I do today. I got a, not a sore throat, but just uh, got, a, I guess the old fashioned, got a frog in my throat. You ever wonder where that terminology came up with? Good morning, John. Good morning. And Rich, how are you doing? We have audio this morning. Anybody want to chime in and let me know? I'm showing that we have audio at uh, so a pretty good level, but I just always want to make sure. Can everybody hear me okay? Working great. Thank you. Frank's our audio engineer this morning. Yeah, I'm just getting myself going. Okay, guys. Hey, good morning, me amigos. How's everyone doing today? I am so glad that you could join us. This week on Coffee with Jim, I have a, a different sort of program. We're going to do a bit of time travel back to the dawn of the American auto industry. And for road trip inspiration, I want to share information about a couple of my favorite museums. For fans of Jim Hinckley's American, regular viewers of this program, this won't come as much of a surprise, but some of these museums are a bit different. You might even say that they're unusual. But I guarantee they're well worth a visit, even if it requires adding a detour to your travel plans. And of course, we also have our trivia contest. This week, the prize is a signed copy of my book, 100 Things to Do on Route 66 Before You Die. We want to give a shout out to Mr. Andy Moroni in Amarillo, Texas, celebrating birthday number 66. And uh, Tom Threlkeld, Paul Linkowski, and Stanfield Major are also doing uh, birthdays today. Well, we'll start with this, a teaser, if you will. To give you an idea what we've got for you this morning, the Automobile Driving Museum in El Segundo, California. It's unlike any auto museum that I'm aware of. First, the collection is expansive, with cars manufactured between the 1890s and the year 2000 on display. Some are historically significant. Did you know that Eleanor Roosevelt drove a Plymouth? The first thing that really sets this museum apart is that most of the cars on display are for rent. But what really, really makes it special is the Sunday drives. Every week, a selection of cars is dedicated to giving the visitor a hands-on experience. And as they use different cars on a rotating schedule, people can come back time and again. Now, isn't that a great way for a younger generation to get interested in vintage vehicles? During my last visit, uh, the cars being used 
spanned automotive history. They were giving rides in an AMC Pacer and a DeLorean, a Model A Ford with rumble seat, a 1915 Cadillac, and 1930 Packard limousine. For more information about the museum, check out their website at www.automobiledrivingmuseum.org. That gives you kind of an idea where we're going this morning. Now, let's take care of a bit of business by giving a hearty thank you to the boys of the road crew for our theme song, Don, Jason, Woody, and Joe. And uh, I also want to give a shout out to some of our sponsors. First, we have the uh, Roadrunner Lodge in Tucumcari, New Mexico. David's attention to detail transports the guest to the luxury hotel of circa 1964 with all the modern conveniences that we've come to expect. And I feel like a bit like a PBS pledge drive by saying this, but crowdfunding is crucial to keeping this and our other programs going. And as our way of saying thank you for the support, I provide an array of exclusive content, as well as discounts on Kingman area walking tours and uh, free access to our pay per view programs. And I also want to say congratulations to Victoria at Victoria Sugar Shack in Kingman, Arizona. It was just announced that she is a winner in General Mills Restaurant Recipe Contest. My dearest friend and I, we uh, paid a visit last week and we tried out her award-winning pumpkin coffee cake. And I got to tell you, absolutely delicious, especially with a nice hot cup of coffee. Now, let's get this program on the road. An argument could easily be made that the cornerstone of the American auto industry and the good roads associations that led to the creation of the U.S. highway system, including Route 66, is the bicycle. By 1890, the penny farthing, that was the uh, old-fashioned bicycle with a big front wheel and a little back wheel. Well, that had been kind of replaced with the modern uh, type safety bicycles, what they called it. And within five years, there was a national mania about bicycles. There were bicycle clubs, long distance bicycle tours, bicycle repair shops, bicycle customizers, and even a service industry that catered to bicycling tourists. In the blink of an eye, the bicycle had become a multi-million dollar business. Many, many automotive and aeronautical pioneers cut their teeth with the bicycle industry. Did you know that Louis Chevrolet was a bicycle manufacturer and racer in France before he immigrated to the United States as an employee of Fiat? There's one for you. Like I say, Paul always said, better to fill your head with useless knowledge than no knowledge at all. It's a story for another day, but the Blood Brothers of Kalamazoo, Michigan, they make for an interesting study. And as a bit of useless knowledge, uh, Buffalo Bill, he bought one of their cars in about 1903. <coughs> Apparently, Celebrity Association must not have translated into sales as the company closed a few years later. A primary problem that plagued bicyclists was the same one that frustrated early motorists. Once you left the city limits, roads suitable for travel with anything besides a horse or horse-drawn wagon was almost non-existent. The lobbying for good roads was at the foundation of League of American Wheelmen. By 1900, the organization had nearly one million members. Of course, that gave the wheelmen tremendous political clout, and it would serve as the foundation for the good roads associations. Um, and I want to share this with you. This is a personal footnote to this chapter in bicycle history. It pertains to my grandfather, the fellow that led to a near lifelong interest and almost obsession, if you will, about the uh, infancy of the auto industry. The short version of a long story is that he was born in 1865 and was 63 years of age when my pa was born. So I never met the fella. But as a kid, when we visited my grandmother at the house on Hinckley Boulevard, I would often ask about a picture of my grandfather, Fred P. Hinckley, and Henry Ford on the mantle. 
the only answer I ever got was that he did work for Henry. Well, that sparked my curiosity, and my curiosity led to a quest that's ongoing. I wanted to know more about Fred P. Hinckley, and that led to my insatiable fascination about this era in history. I have learned over the years that he was a prolific inventor. And a few years ago, I was surprised to learn that he was the inventor behind the coaster brake on the bicycle. In the 1890s, as bicycle mania was sweeping the country, a few visionaries were thinking of new dimensions to the concept of personal transportation. They were working to make old Dobbins obsolete. They were laying the foundation for what would become a multi-million dollar industry within a few short years. Among the many things that amaze me about this era is how quickly the public embraced the automobile. In 1896, it was a circus sideshow curiosity. Montgomery Ward said that it was a fad that children should see before it passes. In less than five years later, there were auto shows, fleets of electric taxis on the streets of New York City, and we were hosting auto races. Here's one of the great points to ponder. Uh, how did pioneering companies sell so many cars? Just, just for a minute, imagine this. You're a car salesman. You go up to somebody and you try to sell a vehicle that cost more than a house. Then to close the deal, you tell them that gasoline has to be ordered, there are no roads to drive the vehicle on, and that it will most likely need extensive repairs in the first thousand miles or so. Nah. Boy, I just, I don't know how they sold those things. Uh, and that takes us to this, a highly recommended museum, especially for Route 66 travelers. Uh, this museum chronicles in rich detail every aspect of this dramatic transportation evolution. It's the uh, National Museum of Transportation in St. Louis. On display are planes, trains, and automobiles more than 100 years of planes, trains, and automobiles. And uh, they've taken things like the old Coral Court Motel that they, they tore down years ago. It was a real famous Route 66 motel. And they took materials and they completely recreated one motel room, uh, service station exhibits, a great exhibition of cars manufactured in St. Louis. And there were a lot of companies that manufactured cars in St. Louis. I guarantee you, you can lose a full day at this museum and there is no risk of boredom. How about a little obscure trivia for you this morning? This poor fellow you're looking at here in the bottom right, that is Mr. Bliss. Now, I don't know how slow Mr. Bliss was, but in 1899, he had the dubious distinction of becoming the first pedestrian in America to be struck and killed by an automobile. He was struck by an electric hansom cab. And as I'm on the subject of electric vehicles, before the introduction of the electric starter on the 1912 Cadillac, electric and steam powered vehicles outsold many of their competitors with gasoline engines. In places such as Boston, it was actually easier to find a place to charge a car's battery than it was to buy gasoline. And uh, it was a bit of a latecomer, but the Woods Dual Electric of 1916, these were manufactured in Chicago. This was an electric car, but it had a four-cylinder gasoline engine. It was a hybrid. See? Nothing new under the sun. Aside from bicycles, many of the uh, early automobile manufacturers had rather diverse origins. Case in point, Pierce Arrow. By 1890, the company was one of the largest manufacturers of household goods in the United States. They produced everything from bird cages to buckets, ice boxes, and bread boxes. And by the mid 1890s, the company had expanded into the production of toys and bicycles. This included pedal cars, wagons, and tricycles. By the teens, the company was a leading manufacturer of luxury cars in the United States. And when it came to prestige, there were three companies that dominated the domestic field and provided serious competition internationally to companies such as Rolls-Royce. Uh, the companies were 
The three P's were Peer, Peerless, Piercero, and Packard. And here's another little bit of trivia for you. This might come as a surprise, but did you know that David Buick made his first fortune in the plumbing business? Here's another little tidbit for you. Buick developed and patented the method for affixing porcelain to cast iron. David Buick was the man behind the white porcelain cast iron bathtub. And of course, he was also the man behind the auto company that uh, carried his name. And that company was the cornerstone for the establishment of General Motors. And as a bit of an historic footnote, Louis Chevrolet and his brothers, Arthur and Gaston, helped put Buick on the map when they signed on to the company's factory racing team. Buick and Pierce Arrow weren't the only companies to begin in fields far removed from automobile manufacturing. Walter Chrysler, he started with the American Locomotive Company. William Durant, the founder of General Motors, he was a partner in Durant Dort, a wagon manufacturing company. Henry Leland was a founder of Cadillac and Lincoln. He kicked off his career as an apprentice with Colt, the firearm manufacturer. Studebaker began as a blacksmith shop. And uh, then they went into manufacturing wheelbarrows at the California gold fields. And uh, along the way, by the late 1870s, they were the largest manufacturer of wheeled vehicles in the world. And that takes us to Nebraska. In a sea of cornfields along US 6 in Nebraska is the little town of Menden. It's home of Harold Warp's Pioneer Village. My last visit uh, left me a bit worried about the museum's future as there were obvious signs of neglect and I can only imagine how hard they've been hit by COVID restrictions. <coughs> Excuse me. This museum complex consistently rates in my top 10 list of must-see obscure attractions. Just the automotive collection itself is nothing short of amazing. Uh, it includes the world's oldest Buick and Cadillac, as well as cords, and they have a huge collection of pre-1930s trucks. What makes these cars really unique is most of them, Harold Warp bought as used cars in the 1950s, 40s, and 50s, and so uh, a lot of them were unrestored, just good used cars, and um, very unusual. But there's more here. Yeah, there's a building that chronicles more than a century of kitchen evolution. Each room is outfitted with all the appliances of a particular period. And you have huge displays that chronicle the evolution of spark plugs, snowmobiles, outboard motors. They even have one of the earliest outboard motors that was designed by Ransom E. Olds. They have a display of historic slot machines, uh, a room full of evolution of cameras. Uh, uh, porcelain tea sets. They even have one of Abraham Lincoln's tea sets. And they have a steam-powered carousel. Wasn't operational last time I was there. And they have a collection of original Courier and Ives prints. That just gives you an idea of the diversity at this outstanding museum. A lot like the dot-com era, stock investors must have had a field day in the infancy of the auto industry. Companies merged or went bankrupt were reorganized or sold at a dizzying pace. As a quick example, consider Coppic's automotive enterprises. Lambert Coppic was an engineer for Apperson, a pioneering automobile manufacturer. And then he took a uh, position with Muriel Manufacturing Company. He acquired that company and established his own motor company. But to avoid bankruptcy, he accepted funding in exchange for a relocation of the company from Kokomo, Indiana to Decatur and reorganized the company under the Decatur name. But he was forced from the company when it was reorganized as Decatur Utility Car Company, manufacturer of Hoosier trucks. All of this took place under the course of just five years. In 1911, Decatur Utility Car Company was acquired by Grand Rapids Motor Truck of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And this company was acquired later by the United Truck Company. And then United Motor Truck Company was absorbed by General Motors. <laughs> the Jackson is another interesting case study. 
almost forgotten today, the Jackson enjoyed tremendous brand loyalty. In addition to durable cars, in the World War I era, the company also manufactured a line of rugged, heavy-duty 4x4 trucks. The cars were entered often in grueling events such as Glidden Tours and, and did quite well. And uh, if you're ever in Jackson, check out the Commercial Exchange Building. That's uh, Jackson, Michigan. Check out the Commercial Exchange Building. Uh, most of the large complex remains intact. The former offices and headquarters of Jackson are now an office complex but the building retains a lot of original architectural detail, including light fixtures and uh, steam radiators. It's really, really something to see. Jackson was one of the larger manufacturers in the city of Jackson, but it was not the only one. And the city was not alone in its efforts to capitalize on the exponential growth of the auto industry. Towns, villages, and cities all over the United States were vying for the title of Motor City. It was a gold rush. Skagway, Alaska had a small manufacturer. Phoenix, Arizona had two. There were companies in Washington, D.C. and Lexington, Kentucky. Most of them were a flash in the pan. Some were just simply swindles, stock swindles. Some of them were in business for years and even decades. Still, even the most successful companies were small manufacturers. So few of them produced less than a thousand cars a year. And that just wasn't enough to compete with the big boys like GM, Ford, Studebaker, Hudson and Packard that were coming to dominate the market. In the beginning years of the auto industry, advertisement and marketing was primitive. It was wordy with few illustrations. Shortly after 1900, Calkins and Holden become the first marketing company to focus almost exclusively on automobile promotion. They transformed the industry by creating colorful, exciting advertisements for Piracero, and they hired leading illustrators of the day to, cr to create these masterpieces. As a little bit of a footnote, some of the early advertising posters created by Calkins and Holden uh, are now considered and sold as fine art, to give you an idea. Uh, slogans became an integral part of a company's effort to build brand recognition. Let's see a show of hands. Who remembers Dinah Shore and See the USA in Your Chevrolet? Uh, how about this one? There's a Ford in your future. I don't mean this derogatory, but if you remember the, the advertising campaign about the Ford in your future and the crystal ball, I think you might be almost as old as rope. One of the things that fueled a tsunami of interest in the automobile were the exploits of adventuresome automobilists. This was also the dawning of the American love affair with the road trip. Alexander Winton's ill-fated attempt at being the first person to drive across the U.S. was covered in Scientific American as a reporter traveled with him. Uh, I published the entire series in serial format as exclusive content on our crowdfunding website. And that series, by the way, produced a huge boost in subscriptions for the magazine, it, it reflective of the, the interest. In 1916, Emily Post's book, By Motor to the Golden Gate, chronicled her trip from New York to California. That became a bestseller. And if you want some interesting reading, I'm happy to report that the book has been reprinted and is currently available through Amazon. Automobile companies were only one component in a dramatic industrial transformation during the first decades of the 20th century. For every auto manufacturer, there were 20 companies manufacturing tires and wheels, windshields, brake lines, and other components. And that takes me to a bit more family history. Uh, on my last trip to Michigan, I discovered Carl Hinckley. Um, it looks like he was a cousin to my grandfather. In any case, my grandfather was apparently involved with Hinkley Motors in Ecorse, Michigan. I don't have a great deal of detail about the company, but do know that the production of heavy-duty engines for use in trucks was their mainstay. And as it turns out, a truck with a Hinkley engine 
is part of the collection at a museum in Minden, Nebraska. And Carl Hinckley went on to develop a diesel engines for Buddha. And I don't have much more information on that. Tools were another industry that exploded as automobile production soared. And that's another little enterprise that my grandfather was apparently involved with. Uh, Hinckley Meyer Tool Company. It was established in about 1919. It was acquired by Kent Moore in 1936. Apparently, the company produced more than just regular hand tools. They also manufactured specialty tools for Fisher Body, Hudson, Studebaker, and Olds. To date, I have also learned that they manufactured wheel alignment equipment. They sold a kit to fully outfit a service station. They manufactured floor jacks, tool chest, and assorted brake tools. And uh, of course, they were headquartered in Jackson, Michigan. And Jackson, Michigan was also home to Sparks Withington. This company started with the manufacture of farm equipment in the 1860s and 70s. With the boom in automobile manufacturing, the company diversified. Counted among their many innovations was one of the first electric auto horns. By the late teens, they were the largest manufacturer of horns in the world. They were used by dozens of companies, including Hudson and Studebaker. And uh, as you can see here, they, uh, as they expanded, in 1926, they moved into the old Jackson Automobile Company factory. It's now known as the Commercial Exchange Building. They ran three shifts per day, and each horn was tested before leaving the factory. How would you like to live in that neighborhood? <laughs> Spartan also pioneered radios for home as well as automobile use. Uh, they started this back in uh, around the 1920 period. And in the late 1930s, they were a pioneer in the development and production of television equipment. During the 1930s, they were a leading manufacturer of home radios. And some of these were just Art Deco masterpieces that are highly sought after by collectors today. Uh, the blue mirrored radios here at the center and at the right, uh, they, the floor models have recently sold for an excess of $10,000 when they rarely turn up at auction. Just, I mean, just stunning pieces, uh, uh, transcend appliances. And that takes me to another great museum recommendation. The Ye Old Carriage Shop in Spring Arbor, Michigan. This is near Jackson. Uh, Lloyd Ganton has amassed a massive and diverse collection of anything and everything manufactured in Jackson. In addition to an array of Spartan products, uh, horns, radios, TVs, He's acquired representative models from 20 of the 24 automobile companies that operated in Jackson. And he also has a huge collection of jukeboxes, some more than 90 years old, pedal cars from the 1890s and the 1950s, Coca-Cola memorabilia, gas pumps, historic signage. It is an awe-dropping collection. Uh, but this is a private museum and reservations are required. With that said, if you're in the neighborhood, this is well worth your time to try and get a visit. This museum is without equal. A lot of these cars on display, a lot of these items on display, they're literally the only ones in existence. And I've said it before, and I say it often, the period between 1885 and 1930 was an era of dramatic transition. With the exception of the period between 1995 and 2020, I don't think there's ever been a more transitional time in history. Uh, aside from the railroad, people traveled just as they had for centuries. And then in less than 20 years, a drive from coast to coast in a week or less, it was just an accepted way of life. Generational family businesses, carriage and harness makers, they were just swept from the stage. They were transformed in historic footnotes. By 1920, more people owned an automobile than had indoor plumbing. 
And when Emily Post and Etzel Ford made their cross-country trips in 1915, they shared the road with horse-drawn wagons, carriages, and stagecoaches. Rather than close this out the way I usually do with a few inspirational words, I'm going to share a quick version of the Ezra Meeker story. You know, the older we get, the harder it is to adapt to changing times. And Zoom and all the technologies that we take for granted today and been pushed into using. And with years like 2020, those changes were made at lightning speed. The transition can be just overwhelming and daunting. For inspiration, though, let's look at people like the amazing Mr. Meeker. This fellow adapted, this fellow survived, and he even thrived. He survived a trip over the Oregon Trail with an ox cart. He survived trips into the Yukon. He survived the Civil War, World War I, and the Spanish flu pandemic. And he transitioned from ox carts to automobiles and even to airplanes. That, my friends, is an inspirational story. Get a chance. Uh, do some reading. Do a little bit of research on Mr. Ezra Meeker. Quite a surprise. Okay, let's get to our trivia contest. This one might stump even the most ardent auto enthusiast that spent years filling his head with useless knowledge and obscure trivia. <clears throat> Any guesses? First right answer gets a copy of 100 Things to Do on Route 66 Before You Defy, Before You Die, defaced with my signature. Andy, thank you for the mug from the Pima Air Museum, our coffee mug sponsor of the week. I have to say I am familiar with the Pima Air Museum. Uh, never been there, but it has long, long been on my list. And uh, hopefully this year we get back to the road trips. And uh, we're overdue for a visit down to see some uh, folks down in uh, Tombstone. My wife's family is from Tombstone. And... Uh, it's on our list. We'll add the Pima Air Museum. Andy, thank you. Our plan, subject to change as everything is lately, but next week on Coffee with Jim, I want to guide you on a condensed tour of one of the most interesting highways I know of in America, US 6, the forgotten cousin of iconic Route 66. It's an odd highway. It seems to go nowhere on purpose and... Uh, it's definitely a, a unique adventure, and I think you're going to have a lot of fun with this one. Invite your friends. Let's make it a coffee party. Before we get to uh, your questions this morning, I want to say thank you to Connie Eccles of the iconic Wagon Wheel Motel in Cuba, Missouri. Your sponsorship of our program is greatly appreciated. As a bit of a travel tip, in my humble opinion, a Route 66 Odyssey can't be considered complete without a stay at the Wagon Wheel uh, Motel and a visit with Connie. Uh, here's a little thought for you. If you stay at Connie's, she puts on coffee pretty early in the morning. Uh, run down to the Cuba Bakery on, on Main Street, one block off Route 66 and pick up some goodies and uh, wander back to the hotel, have some coffee, visit with Connie, and uh, you'll be surprised. Sit down and talk, listen, talk to the guest and uh, discover the essence of Route 66. Well, uh, kept her pretty close to a half hour this morning. I hope you enjoyed this. Let's see, uh, before I get one more thing before we get to your questions this morning is a bit of shameless self-promotion. Autographed copies of my books are available on our website, jimhinkleysamerica.com. I just got a new shipment of Murder in Mayhem on the Main Street of America, Tales from Bloody 66. Good morning, Mr. Mike Bailiff. I hope you guys, Michael Fennessy, I hope you guys are staying warm. Andy from Tucson, Frank Jameson, back in the cold country. John from Holbrook, Mr. Rich Henry from the Rabbit Ranch, Staunton, Illinois. Well, God bless. We're doing okay. 35 yesterday. It's a heat wave.
Ian, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm a bit froggy this morning, my friends. Keith Kentner, good morning. Marion Pavel, how are you, sir? David, good morning. 80s today in Tucson, God bless. Mr. Harley, good morning. Maggie, all the way from Michigan? Linda, I'm glad you got out of your yard yesterday. Man, I don't miss that country tall come winter time. Miss Angie, how are you doing today? Just the mention of Jackson, huh? Well, that's not good. I didn't know that, Andy. Yeah, that's a Ford test track out there in Yucca. An old uh, one of the auxiliary fields from the Kingman Army Airfield. Angela, thank you. Angela's with us this morning. She's putting together uh, a real gym on Route 66, bringing new life to the Cactus Inn Motel in McLean, Texas. You know, McLean, Texas, let's face it, it's been on the fast track to ghost town for a long time, but it's a neat town, well worth some exploration. And it just so happens, Angela's Motel, it was in within spitting distance of the Red River Steakhouse, a great place to eat. Yeah, REO Speedwagon. Um, Angie, there is uh, downtown here, there's an old REO Speedwagon truck for sale. Yeah, Lloyd Ganton's museum is a must-see. REO Speedway, yeah. Oh, there's also, our REO, by the way, is Ransom E. Olds, for those who didn't know that. And it was his second company after he kind of lost control of Olds. Uh, downtown at uh, Dutton Motors, they have a beautiful 1931 REO coupe for sale. Uh, Angela, unfortunately, no. Um, this is an American car. And uh, it was manufactured before 1920. I don't know if that helps or not. Well, <clears throat> any questions? Anything I can uh, answer for you this morning? Or are we going to wrap her up? You know, I'm always glad that we get together. I wish we could do this in person. And I hope to be taking the show on the road this year. And uh, I enjoy these mornings very much. And I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, it's always a pleasure and a delight. And uh, when we get together, and I uh, hope you can join us next week, invite your friends, invite your neighbors. Yeah, uh, uh, Nolan, US-6 is a, is a really interesting highway. To be honest, I have never driven it in its entirety. I've driven big sections of it. Uh, originally, it's a very odd highway. It starts in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, out on the very tip, and uh, runs all the way originally to Long Beach, California, but now it's been truncated at uh, Bishop, California. And uh, it was the long last U.S. highway to be fully paved. There's a section at the Nevada-Utah border that wasn't paved until 1952. It's the highest U.S. highway climbing over Loveland Pass in Colorado. Uh, very interesting highway. Angela, you bet. I, am. I for one, I have stopped at the uh, steakhouse often for lunch or for dinner, uh, the Red River Steakhouse in McLean. To be honest, I have never stayed at the Cactus, but I will be changing that on my next trip. You can bet money. I, I really look forward to it. I enjoyed your video, your live presentation. It looks like you've done an amazing job on the place. Uh, quick question, Angela. Do you know if Delbert True is still around there in McLean? He was uh, quite quite a colorful fella. Uh, for, you know, while we're on the subject of McLean, or I know a lot of the Route 66 people know this, but uh, McLean was once uh, had a brassiere factory, and it was kind of uh, derisive, but they claimed it was the uplift capital of America. But uh, Uh, the uh, uh, the old factory now is a barbed wire museum and Route 66 museum, and uh, it's real well worth a visit. If you don't, you know, it's, it's surprising to think that uh, 
barbed wire could be interesting enough to consume several hours, but it was. Angela, that is wonderful news. Angela says we've got a new store coming into McLean, Texas. Ray of Sunshine, that old town. Uh, a lot of lot of history there. There's a little, an old POW camp outside of town from World War II. Well, uh, folks, I guess we're going to wrap this up. Um, I'm waiting for some uh, microphone cables and some other odds and ends. We're going to take uh, five, continue with our recorded five minutes with Jim audio podcast. And uh, as soon as I get my microphone cables, we're going to experiment. Uh, uh, we're going to let the, I sure will, Maggie. As soon as I get my microphone cables, we uh, uh, are going to try to do a live interaction audio uh, podcast. Start a new uh, weekly program on that as well as our Sunday morning program. Uh, no, Delbert True, he would he lived out towards uh, outside of town. Let's see, he lived out towards had a ranch out towards Jericho, but he worked at the museum a lot. He and his wife. Oh, it's been five six years since I spoke with him. But uh, he was in his 80s at that time. Really fascinating fella. Uh, we'll have more information on Jericho, too, coming up. Jericho, Texas. they got a big project going out there that, that's pretty exciting. Hey, guys, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, if you know the answer to our trivia question, send it along. Uh, Mike, uh, I did not know that about Stewart, Iowa. But uh, we'll, we'll make a good... Uh, we're going to have some fun with US 6 next week. Um, see if we can inspire a road trip or two. That one's been on my list for a long time. Uh, I've always wanted to drive it end to end. It's a, it's a pretty amazing and interesting highway. Well, folks, thank you for joining us today. Angela, I hope you're doing well. Maggie, Mike, uh, hopefully we'll see everybody next week. And uh, hopefully we'll be... Well, free of technical glitches. And like I say, we got all the things. Check out the uh, Facebook page on uh, for our audio podcast, Five Minutes with Jim. And, uh, of course, uh, you can find lodging information, uh, recommendations on our website, jimhinkleysamerica.com. We have a page for each of the eight states. We have a link so you can book a room at the Cactus Inn in McLean, Texas. Uh, Daniel, good morning from Godly, Illinois. Frank, truly my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a bit different. Uh, as to the Automobile Driving Museum, they, they're still closed because of COVID, and I'm hoping they survive all of this very, very well. Uh, Frank, if we come through on Route 6, you can bet money we'll give you a holler ahead of time. Uh, the Automobile Driving Museum is great to see at any time. But if you're going to be in the area, it's just south of Santa Monica. Uh, it's just a short Route 66 detour. Of course, in the Los Angeles area, any even a short detour can take an hour with traffic. But uh, yeah, try to try to visit the museum when they're giving their driving tours on Sunday. Uh, it's a great adventure. Uh, fun to take you for a ride in a Model A Ford Coupe or, or a 1915 Cadillac. It's, it's quite an adventure. My friends, thank you so very, very much. And uh, got some things coming up. Working on a video series, a pilot program that you're going to see more of in the coming weeks. And uh, hopefully this year we'll be back on the road. Oh, one more thing. Uh, <clears throat> I've been giving, uh, our crowdfunding has made it possible for me to do uh, presentations for a lot of organizations like uh the Rotary Club and El Paso and Garden Clubs in Spokane. Uh, I didn't realize, and I didn't think about this, and I, I, but a lot of organizations like Rotary Clubs, they have had a, problems with fundraising in, uh, in 2020. So I'm starting to work with them on uh, putting together presentations that they can do as pay-per-view via Zoom or other venues as fundraisers for their organizations. And uh, if I can help your organization with a presentation as a fundraiser, please, please let me know. Meanwhile, my friends, stay safe, stay warm, 
Uh, keep the wheels right side up for those out there driving on icy stuff. And well, we'll do.